Hi, folks. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, as uh, Taylor has mentioned, it's too beautiful a day here uh, for our purposes. Um, but uh, uh, I'll note this beforehand, we will record this. And if people um, have use for this further, know people who couldn't make it today, et cetera, just be in touch with us. And we're, we're happy to uh, try and make this have a, uh, a long shelf life. Um, we're here today um, at a uh, somewhat difficult juncture, it seems to me, um, in the uh, effort for uh, a national Medicare for all program, a single payer healthcare program. Um, we've been at this for a while. Some of us, uh, our speakers bring a great deal of experience and people in the, pa uh, in the audience bring even longer uh, experience in some cases. Um, any of you who worked on Proposition 187 uh, in 1994 were prepared to lose at that point, which we uh, decidedly did, but might not have been prepared for another 27 years, uh, bringing us here today, uh, still uh, with nothing really on the horizon. And we come off a period that makes this, I think, particularly difficult for us because we had to our Great surprise, uh, I would say, a, uh, a viable presidential candidate who was a uh, major advocate for the program. And although we have never had the votes in Congress, uh, we would have, we had the prospect of at least having an advocate in the White House. And that, of course, is extremely uh, uh, substantial. Uh, we do not have that at this point, as everyone knows. Uh, this president has said he would veto the bill if it got to him. Um, that's kind of um, uh, a wet blanket uh, statement if there ever was one. And the fact of the matter is we have now a majority of uh, the Democratic members of the House, uh, which is a substantial achievement given where we've come from. But uh, that's a, ma a majority of what is itself only a slight majority of the overall house. So brings us to the question, uh, what do we do now? What do we do in this period of several years when the, the chance of getting an actual piece of legislation uh, through Congress would appear to be nil, uh, which was not the uh, prospect we were looking at a year ago and, uh, and a couple of years ago. So uh, we've invited this panel here today and are very pleased uh, to have the people we have. The first I am going to introduce to you is uh, Dr. Susan Rogers. She's the president of Physicians for a National uh, Health Program. And this is uh, one of the longest running uh, organizations that, that's been advocating this position. They go back to 1987. And those were really days when doctors in general were thought to oppose such things. The American Medical Association ran the, uh, the show and um, it was a radical statement for this group to even come into existence. Um, Susan is also an assistant professor of medicine at Rush University. She's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a member of the National Medical Association. Um, and she's going to speak on the topic of Medicare for All as the solution to current maternal and infant mortality and life expectancy inequities. So, Susan, take it away. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I appreciate being on this panel and uh, able to share some of my thoughts with you. I do have about three slides that I want to share. Um, so let me get that done and we can start those. Uh, this happened before. How come this didn't? <laughs> um, there we are. Can you see those? I'm no, still we, seeing you. We can't see them. Which is okay, but not what you were looking to do. This isn't working. That's okay. Let me just go without my slides. And I like slides sometimes because I think sometimes, at least with me personally, a visual sometimes has a stronger effect. You can just see the difference. Whereas you can say 10 versus 20, yeah, that's a big difference. But sometimes when you see it on the slide, it has more impact. But 
One of the things about uh, maternal deaths in this country, uh, especially maternal deaths, is it's, it's abysmal when we tout ourselves as having the best care health, just best healthcare system in the world, which we all know that that is not true. But one of the things that, what's on my slide, it just shows the uh, maternal mortality rates in other countries uh, here. And the highest of which on this slide is the UK, which has a maternal mortality of 9.2 per thousand deaths, per, per thousand births. The United States is 26.4. It's almost three times as much as the worst European country there is. And that doesn't even tell us the whole picture because this country has such alarming inequities that just having data really doesn't really say how much we have as a problem. Uh, the causes for these, this mortality in specific groups differ. So we can't approach this with a single solution anymore that we can solve any of the problems in this country with a colorblind solution. There have to be specific uh, addresses to problems in certain communities, certain ethnic groups, certain races, because otherwise we will not solve it. Now, black women are dying at similar rates as women in developing countries, whereas white women are dying at rates at, uh, of affluent uh, European countries. And when I say women are dying, I mean, that's the maternal mortality. So that that's the inequity that we have here. We can't just compare this country to other like countries. We have to compare the groups within the, the, our country to other countries. And the fact that black women are dying at rates similar to developing comfortable countries, I think really emphasizes how awful that statistic really is. And part of the reason, there's a lot of reasons why this is, and I will get to that in a bit. But one of which is that the workforce for maternal and infant care is backwards in this country. Here we focus on mostly obstetricians and gynecologists. We focus on physicians. Whereas in other countries, they focus on midwives, they focus on doulas, they focus on nurses, they have a good postpartum treatment and follow-up plan. We don't do that here. It's sort of like, okay, you have your baby. I hope your mother will help you so that you won't be alone. And you're just left to your own resources. Along with the bias and the racism within our healthcare system that makes it even more difficult to survive for black women and other women of minorities. So our workforce isn't geared, it isn't, just, it isn't built to address the problems that are created by the structural racism in this country and in our healthcare system. And then if we look at rural communities, that's a, the discrepancies there are a lot related to access. There's 179 counties, rural counties in this country that have now have no OB services. There are over, um, there's no hospital for many that provide any maternal care because these services have been uh, removed from the system. And that is because the way we finance healthcare, it is made to make a profit. And because a lot of rural hospitals, uh, the patients are funded by Medicare or Medicaid, or they're unfunded. They're not the wealthier hospitals. They barely make it. And so they're the ones that can least afford uh, maternal care. So infant mortality rates are often, for Blacks though, are still higher in, in urban areas, even higher than in rural areas because of the, the bias and the racism that exists in this country. One of the things that has been developed in rural communities though are birthing centers, which are freestanding. They've almost doubled the number in the last 10 years. And that is one attempt at trying to uh, resolve the issue of what is causing the discrepancy in the mortality rate. Now, one of the things we have to acknowledge too is that maternal mortality is really indicative of how women's lives are not valued in this country. If we look at breast cancer 
breast cancer statistics, cervical cancer rates. These are easily screened for and easily, not easily, but they can be treated when caught early. And there aren't a lot of resources for women to go and get access to this care. Now, women, maternal deaths started to rise about in the 1990s, and by 2013, it had doubled. And this was when other countries actually started decreasing. And one of the things that has happened, too, is that we have what we call severe maternal morbidity. And that is a life-threatening uh, situation with a woman who has just given birth that could be life-threatening. And most of these are preventable but they've increased by 200%. And they are, there are more of these uh, life-threatening incidences, 70 times as many as there is per death. So this is a phenomenal, and actually when you think about it, an extremely dangerous situation to be in giving birth, which is a, a natural thing that we do. And we have the, the resources, we have the knowledge, we have the ability to address these, but we don't because of the way we finance our healthcare system. Um, one of the things that is, makes this also difficult to follow a little bit is that we look at uh, the postpartum uh, time as six weeks out um, of after birth, whereas the CDC looks at postpartum as a year. And so there's been some discrepancy as how to calculate mortalities. Um, and it wasn't until 2003 that pregnancy was a box you could check on a death certificate. So there was a lot of maternal deaths that were never even acknowledged or statistically counted because that wasn't uh, there was no ability in the death certificate and it's still not a requirement for all states to do that. So a lot of times only deaths that happen six weeks during the postpartum period. Uh, and it's interesting that Mongolia has a better tracking of maternal deaths than we do in this country. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about weathering. I hope everybody's familiar with the term. And what it is, is it's just, it's an aging process that occurs to blacks who live in this country, to immigrants who live in this country. And it's related to the stress that your body undergoes by living here. And when we say it's not race, it's racism, that's what we mean, um, that being black in this country will make you sicker. And this was found um, by a, a public health professor at Harvard in the 80s, where she found that teen pregnancies, those girls were actually having better outcomes than black women in their 20s. And she, she realized and she, through her studies found that this was because of weathering. Even though they were young, their bodies were still older because of all of the effect of this weathering. And I won't get into the scientifics of that, but it's just the stress that comes from having to deal with severe poverty, having to deal with racism, having to deal with the violence where that is an everyday struggle when you live in severe poverty. And what happens is that as this happens day to day to day, it, it wears your body out and you learn how to cope oftentimes with self-destructive behaviors so that it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's something that's very difficult. And you, so you can't just tell people, well, you need to eat better and exercise. That's, that's not the solution. So what we have to do really is address this by looking at all the social determinants of health because access to care, which I strongly support with my work uh, advocating for Medicare for all, isn't gonna solve all that data, all of this uh, inequity because it happens to women even with higher socioeconomic status. Look at what happened to Beyonce. Look at what happened to Serena Williams. These women had no difficulty getting access, no difficulty paying for their medical care. Now, there is now a bill that has been put out, the Black Maternal Health Omnibus, and that's been uh, one of the centers from Illinois where I live, Lauren Underwood, is one of the sponsors of that. And that actually is trying to address the social determinants of health, one of which is access to care. Um, and that should um, try, it's to address the inequities. It was presented last year. It didn't even get out of committee. I'm not sure what will happen. Um, 
with us now, but for childbirth being the most common reason women go to the hospital, it is not addressed with the urgency, it is not addressed with the, the resources, it is not addressed with the numbers that make it is that address it at, as the seriousness of the problem that it really is. And those are my opening comments. Yes, the MC must uh, unmute himself. Always good practice. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. Um, our next speaker is Stephanie Nakajima. She is the Director of Communications for Healthcare Now. Uh, in the past, she has been a volunteer at Mass Care, the Massachusetts Campaign for Single Payer Healthcare, and has previously worked at the Danish Institute for Human Rights and the Danish Refugee Council in Copenhagen. And those of you who got here for the early chatter uh, may have picked up that um, she notified me earlier today that she is in fact speaking from Copenhagen. Uh, where it is now about 11.20 uh, at night. And uh, she is perhaps um, spending uh, much of her days mulling on the difference between uh, the Danish healthcare system and uh, the American, but uh, she'll let you know about that. Uh, she is gonna speak today on the National Medicare for All push. Stephanie, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And thank you. Yes, I have actually been spending quite a lot of time thinking about that because, you know, last year I was here because my father-in-law was very ill uh, and now my mother-in-law is terminally ill. And so I've I've actually got to see a lot of people born and die in the Danish healthcare system. And um, it is really remarkable to live through and experience uh, what a functioning healthcare system uh, really looks like in your very worst days and your family's worst days. It's so essential that it's that the healthcare system works for you and um, not for insurers. So um, definitely more fuel for my my work. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Stephanie Nakajima um, and I work for Healthcare Now, which is um, a national single issue, you know, Medicare for all organization. And there's two things uh, that I'd like to talk about uh, today. One is just quickly about the bills in Congress, H.R. 1976, and soon also coming Bernie Sanders' companion bill in the Senate, um, where we are with the co-sponsors and who we need to get to bring Medicare for all over the finish line. Um, and the second thing I want to talk about is just more broadly what I think it will take to pass a Medicare for all bill um, in the face of unprecedented industry cash and opposition. So first to talk just a little bit about the congressional landscape. Um, so of course, to pass Medicare for all through Congress, I think Tom mentioned this at the beginning, we will need 218 votes in the House and 51 in the Senate at minimum. <laughs> We're about halfway there in the House, a quarter way there in the Senate. Um, Healthcare Now did sort of a, an analysis of where we've already got co-sponsors and where the remaining co-sponsors are. And, and first, um, the thing, there are of course trends here uh, with the ones that we've already gotten and the ones that we need to get. So the first one I wanna point out is just that, you know, uh, the areas that we already, the, the areas in which we already have co-sponsors, those co-sponsors tend to represent urban areas, uh, low income areas, and in terms of representation are disproportionately people of color. And actually the majority of our co-sponsors in the house are um, people of color and significantly disproportionately women of color. So, you know, women of color are basically holding up the bill in Congress right now. Um, and it's funny because, you know, we do, you know, we talk a lot about like organizing black and brown uh, people to win Medicare for all, but actually um, the people on a national level who are left to organize on this on this issue are by and large white non-urban people. Um, and of course, that's not to say that we don't need a multiracial movement to finish the job because many of those remaining districts have gerrymandered areas uh, where, you know, uh, sort of lower income and maybe 
often black and brown areas that are are just sort of like pushed in with like a wealthier white area. Um, you know, those gerrymandered areas are going to be crucial to winning uh, this dis districts that are the, the remaining districts, which are do tend to be wealthier, more suburban, rural, or exurban rather than urban. Um, so what is left essentially uh, is the multiracial working class, right? Um, which includes a lot of white people. Um, and another thing uh, that we noticed when we did our analysis is that the existing, the, uh, the first 100 and, let's see, we have 115 co-sponsors now, um, are almost entirely from non-swing districts. They're from like really safe blue areas. Um, and then 30% of the remaining Democrats are in swing districts. That's full 30%. Um, and that's going to be an interesting and different political terrain, I think, to, uh, to, to deal with as we move into the second and hardest, I think, phase of, of um, organizing for Medicare for All. And as I said before, the median income in districts where we already have co-sponsors um, is, is Fair, significantly lower than that in the remaining districts. So there is um, there is going to be an, an issue here about who are we going to organize in the remaining districts? Are we going to focus on organizing rich white people? I don't think that's obviously going to be the answer, um, but we are going to have to be strategic about um, how we deal with those districts and who we organize there. And um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get um, a robust sort of unshakable uh, movement for Medicare for all in those districts. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, the 114 or 15 districts where we have successfully won over representatives are sort of fundamentally different from the next 118 districts that we still need to win. And I haven't even talked about the Senate at all, but I just thought that maybe this isn't super relevant to San Francisco DSA. So if you want to see more, uh, we did a 25 minute uh, video diving a little bit deeper into these findings, and I'll just um, throw the link up here in the chat. Um, yeah, and so just to talk about, like, for our part at Healthcare Now, I mean, um, because we take the national view, we're starting to focus on like non-urban districts. You know, we've chosen a couple of key target districts in Iowa and Ohio, and some suburban and exurban districts in places like New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Just try to start to, and I mean, I'm just being actually very honest about this. We don't have a lot of experience in organizing in those places. And um, our New York, our uh, friends in New York who have done an amazing job of organizing uh, in their state are also struggling with those areas, which are the ones that they also have left. It's been interesting to watch sort of the state of New York and uh, see like what's up ahead, I think, for <laughs> uh, the national movement. But yeah, so we're, you know, we're sort of trying to figure out, you know, the, the politics and the sensibilities of the urban Medicare for all voter, the socialists, who I think, you know, I think are a distinct and different animal from the rest that we're going to need to pass the bill, you know, voters who make up a coalition that can win in, in, in different districts. So, um, next, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what winning I think might look like. Um, so the bill, of course, isn't an end all be all strategy, um, but it is a sort of like minimum stress test, right? That is like, if you can't get your legislator on the bill, then your organizing hasn't really hit a minimum strength needed to engage in the Medicare for all fight. Um, and of course, that's going to be like totally different if you're in like a really safe, really progressive district versus, you know, maybe Nancy Pelosi's district. <laughs> um, I think that if you can win in Nancy Pelosi's district, then you've really built something. Um, but I do think that, you know, overall, just getting on the bill for most districts, um, it's, it's not quite enough. Um, it's just a structure test, right? So the second thing I wanted to talk about is just more broadly, you know, what I think it will take to win. And when I think about what it looks like in the days and months, the year maybe before we actually win Medicare for all, um, I think it looks really different from where we are right now. Um, I think it boils down to this. Essentially, we need to amass enough power that 
for our legislators, not doing Medicare for all causes greater political consequences for legislators than, than passing Medicare for all. So, you know, to talk about going back to Congress, you know, co-sponsorship being sort of a bare minimum, when industry money is like raining from the sky, our legislators need to be not only co-sponsors of the bill, but they have to be willing to fight and vote for it when insurers, you know, who are going to be in an existential fight for their <laughs> very existence, <laughs> are throwing everything that they have at us. So, you know, not only do we need to get to a certain number of co-sponsors, um, but the commitment level of those co-sponsors in many cases right now is actually quite shallow. And we need their commitment to be a lot deeper. So, you know, once we have those sponsors on, work isn't done, still lots of concrete steps that those uh, reps can take, including, you know, the next thing we usually ask is joining the Medicare for All Caucus. Uh, and then after that, holding Medicare for All town hall in their district, starting to write op-eds about the need for Medicare for All, basically transforming into Bernie Sanders or AOC, right? So um, there's also different levels of commitment that we can hold our legislators accountable to. And I think that when I when I think about like the end stage, and I hope that this doesn't happen in the end stage, but <laughs> these fights will have to happen before we get to the end stage. I think um, the toughest fights are going to be over abortion and undocumented immigrants. Um, and this is probably obvious to everyone in this audience, but just to be clear, um, because it's not actually been to um, maybe non-socialist audiences, abortion has to be in this bill. Uh, if we try to pass a Medicare for all bill and say like, oh, abortion is too controversial, we'll add it later, then the bill is just dead in the water. Because of course, you know, aside from that being a huge moral issue, a significant number of privately insured people do have abortion coverage through their private insurance. So you'd actually be taking insurance away by in instituting a Medicare for all system that doesn't have abortion. And we'd be going backwards. So dead in the water right there. Um, and that means that we just need publicly funded abortion to be really normalized. And so I think a good intermittent victory we can make on this issue is repealing Hyde, for example. Repealing Hyde is absolutely a part of Medicare for all, right? It brings us closer to Medicare for all, as well as fighting restrictive Medicaid restrictions <laughs> at the state level. So, you know, uh, still 33 states, I believe, severely um, curtail the ability of Medicaid to pay for abortion. Basically, you can't get an abortion um, in those states um, through Medicaid unless your, your life is in danger. Um, so that's, I would say the first thing is that, you know, we wanna have that fight sooner than later. Um, uh, and then, you know, the major reproductive justice organizations, like when I envision the very end stage, right before we pass Medicare for all, I think Planned Parenthood, NARA, like other, you know, big organizations that, that do abortion, they need to actually step off the sidelines and champion Medicare for all. And that's a push that has to come from their members. Um, they have been facing increasing pressure to do so, and they have taken a few grudging steps towards support, but they remain largely in the same political sphere as Dem leadership, which will also have to be brought on board. And I'll get to that in just a second. And so the last two things I think, or three things are immigration, same thing that we have in regards to the fight over abortion, you know, some categories of undocumented immigrants, particularly younger ones, are becoming eligible finally for the health care they deserve. I know in California actually is leading the way on this is, um, you know, Medicaid is now open to more uh, undocumented immigrants. Um, and if we move to a single payer system without including undocumented immigrants, then we create a situation where we're taking health care away from people again, right? And that's a problem. So, you know, a very necessary incremental step like abortion is to start normalizing public funds for healthcare for the undocumented, including more states need to be working on um, uh, expanding eligibility, um, both Medicaid and Medicare. And that can definitely be a fight that we take up within the next four years uh, at the national level as well. And then of course, in the final phase, there will be more unions that will not just tacitly support Medicare for all, but I believe should really be leading the way on Medicare for all. Um, and then finally, just to, to dovetail with that, I think, um, you know, thinking again within the framework of, you know, Medicare for all being not doing Medicare for all being a larger political gamble than passing Medicare for all. 
I don't think we're going to pass this bill if we're still fighting Democrats on it. And that means leadership as well. So House, Senate, executive leadership must not only stop fighting Medicare for all, but they actually have to start championing it. And I'm a little afraid whenever I say that because I think a lot of people hear it and they'll say, oh, now we're gonna, she's telling us we have to sit around and wait until Nancy Pelosi is ready to get on board <laughs> or we have to trust them to do it when the time is right. Um, or any, any sort of reliance on any person in power to do the right thing is not ex exactly not what I'm saying. And it's certainly not gonna happen. What it does, what I just mean by that is that we can't give up on any legislators. We can't say this party is never going to give us what we want. You know, it has to. It's the political infrastructure we have to, to affect change. And we don't have to wait for new candidates or new parties to ride in and save us, right? We can make our legislators bend to our will. So um, in some, I think, you know, we only get what we're organized to take. So let's keep organizing. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, all right, I notice that there is a lively discussion going on about uh, healthcare facilities uh, in my old hometown of uh, Boston. Um, and I want to encourage, which is great, but I also want to encourage people to uh, be thinking up questions and putting them in chat. Um, with that, let me introduce the uh, next speaker. Seamus Cook uh, is a rank and file union activist for SEIU Local 503. Uh, as a community organizer, he has helped lead successful campaigns in Portland, Oregon, involving tenants' rights with the Portland Tenants United and raising the statewide minimum wage with 15 now Oregon. And uh, I know he has uh, written some uh, on the topic and uh, including at least uh, one article that had something to do with, uh, uh, which was something of an impetus actually for us being here today. And uh, Seamus is going to speak today on the need to transition from education to mass action. So take it away, Seamus. Thank you, Tom, for the invite today. Um, so I'm talking today kind of from an organizer perspective, um, from labor and tenants rights, as Tom mentioned, and I wasn't invited today because of an article I wrote in January called the Medicare for all at the crossroads, which I'll post in the chat afterwards. Um, but to summarize that article, basically, um, I was saying that, uh, now feels like a special moment. Uh, for Medicare for all specifically because of the pandemic, obviously, uh, but also because of what is still, in my opinion, a time of mass politics. Uh, you had Trump and Bernie and Black Lives Matter and just the pandemic, um, things are changing very fast and politics is changing very fast. And I think we have the demand, the right demand for the right time. Um, uh, unpack that first uh, odd context by saying that I first started writing about Medicare for all after Obama was elected. Um, and the, and those were kind of the dark ages of the left still. But of course, were groups working on the issue. And of course, universal health care is an old demand in the US. Uh, but back then, it was a pretty um, kind of underground demand, Medicare for all. Uh, and so we were limited to doing education mainly and trying to recruit groups to teach them about the demand and have them endorse the, the concept, basically. Um, and the point is that things have changed significantly. And the, We've gone through two Bernie Sanders campaigns for president. And those acted essentially as a mass education campaign for Medicare for all. Um, and so they were very successful. Um, just last year, for example, basically every me major media outlet discussed and debated Medicare for all. And the polls suggest that we have won that debate uh, pretty decisively. Um, so a major hurdle of any campaign is education, and we've cleared a pretty major hurdle. Not that we stop educating, but um, I think that is the raw material, at least a key ingredient to mass mobilizing. 
Um, and now we have another key ingredient, which is the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has exposed the utter failures of the existing system. The employer-based healthcare system has been exposed um, because of mass layoffs. And after mass layoffs, you lose your health insurance, of course. And uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, has been exposed as being unaffordable um, and getting worse every year. Uh, we have tens of millions of people prior to the pandemic who had no health insurance. So the entire existing healthcare system has been exposed uh, at the worst possible time as being deeply broken. Um, and we have the only solution the public really knows about and supports. Uh, that's why I called it a, a bulletproof demand in the article, which is cheesy, uh, but it's also useful, I think. It's bulletproof because it's unassailable. Uh, our opposition has nothing to say that really is convincing and compelling to normal people. And it's bulletproof also because, again, at this moment right now, our demand is the perfect demand for the moment. And that should give us confidence to be more aggressive and to go into mobilizing. Um, and I think what I'm saying today would not be uh, controversial if Bernie had won. Um, and I think his loss, it's pretty obvious that the left has been demoralized by his loss and activists uh, among Medicare for all people also, of course, have been demoralized. Uh, too many of us put too many eggs in the Bernie basket. And I think there was an assumption that after Biden won that our issue is off the table. And of course, Biden would like that. Uh, but I think we have to remember that Medicare for all is a power unto itself. Um, Bernie channeled that power as part of his campaign. And it's our job to channel that power now at this time, especially. Um, I also think another possible mistake that some leftists are making is projecting their demoralization onto the broader working class. Um, and I would say that it's possible or, or even likely that the broader working class feels more empowered now than they have um, ever when it comes to government. There is now for the first time decades in my lifetime for sure, an expectation that government will take action to help working people. Uh, you know, we've had three stimulus checks, uh, unemployment extensions, um, moratoriums on evictions and other stuff too. So people for the first time ever expect government to take action. And that puts government at a very vulnerable position and they know it. This is why a Republican controlled Senate passed stimulus checks twice. None of those people ever thought they would ever do that in their lifetime and they did it. So this, and because it is a time of mass politics still, we have multiple crises happening, nothing is stable. We have a police crisis, a housing crisis, climate crisis, a healthcare crisis. Um, and things have to be done to fix it. And so right now, especially, is important because Biden has been talking about his plan for healthcare. He knows he has to do something because the system Seamus, you can't be heard. Ask them to help us to a day of action or a week of action sometime in the summer, as soon as possible. Um, we have hundreds of organizations, labor and community groups who in recent years have endorsed the concept of Medicare for all. Go back to them, put them to work, get money, resources, outreach, and really put to work every co-sponsor of the current bill. Um, if they support our bill, really have them give some PAC money to the project, have them speak at a rally, have them do media work and tweet about it, really build energy and power around the issue that we can funnel into a vote in Congress. And I'll end by saying, we do need to force a vote. And I know there was some controversy around that. Um, I don't think we should have a vote tomorrow, but I think maybe in six months or a year, 
some time to give us time to really mobilize and express the power of Medicare for all. And once we do that, you'll see the no votes flip into yes. You'll see the co-sponsor list rise dramatically, especially before the midterm elections. We have to make this issue a key issue for the midterm elections. Um, and short of that, I worry that if we don't take big action nationally, if DSA doesn't put their back into this soon, then this issue is going to drift back underground again. And it can't be underground. It's, it's too urgent. We have to keep this in the spotlight, the media spotlight. Um, and I think that's what it all in for now. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Seamus. And we have our last speaker coming up. And that is Michael Lighty. Uh, Michael is a founding fellow of the Standards Institute. Uh, is currently on sabbatical from the California Nurses Association National Nurses Union, where he was director of public policy. He's a past national director of DSA and a current national spokesperson for the DSA Medicare for All campaign. And today he will speak on uh, the topic of building a multiracial mass movement for Medicare for All. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I should say I've, I've officially retired from CNA NNU. And uh, of course, it was the pleasure and honor of my life to work with the registered nurses of, of that union. I, um, I learned so many things from the nurses, uh, one of which uh, was that nurses never give up on their patients or their country. So I, I share that value and I share uh, the perspectives of the other panelists that this fight uh, cannot be lessened. It has to be uh, increased, intensified. And I would also say the issue is not going away because healthcare keeps getting more expensive and people keep not getting the health care they need. And so I think that is going to be the dynamic until we have uh, the improved Medicare for all. What I would offer as um, an analysis of this point in time is that, as Stephanie said, building the multiracial movement for Medicare for all depends upon winning over sectors of the working class that do have an anti-government view, that are very skeptical of the democratic program, and also are wedded to a set of social issues in some cases that mitigate against passing Medicare for all, like coverage of undocumented folks or, or abortion or transgender uh, patients. And so these are, these are real questions, real issues. And we, we have to understand that we're not gonna win Medicare for all on its own. If the minimum wage is 725, it's a doubtful we're going to get Medicare for all. It's doubtful we're going to get it in the context of, of uh, you know, cops continuing to kill black people. And one of the key things about this movement is equity and raising up the value of life and building a mass movement to save lives. Let's be clear, black lives are not valued the same as white lives in this country. And that is true for Latino, Latina, Latinx folks. It's true for AAPI folks, as we've seen. And it's certainly true uh, for Native Indigenous people in this country. And so until we have a mass movement to save everybody's life on a basis of equity, that really, uh, we're going to have a tough time winning Medicare for all. But that demand to save lives can animate our movement in a different way, give it new emotional power. And I think it's essential. We have to understand, looking at the Lancet Commission report that came out earlier this year, if you compare the US to other comparable countries and compare the excess deaths in the US to those other comparable countries, all of which have national healthcare systems, we're the only one that doesn't, we had 461,000 excess deaths in 2018 that can be attributed to a lack of a national health system. And that, that really is, and should be understood as a moral outrage and as a extreme example of the kind of individualist society we've built. And Medicare for all at a fundamental level represents an ethos of solidarity. And that solidarity has to convince BIPOC folks that all means all. That really we're not just, and we have to call that out and say, 
black women who are be giving birth will no longer die at six times the rate of Anglo women, that they will get co culturally competent care as, as Dr. Rogers has so eloquently illustrated the need for. And, and so all has to mean all, but we can't just say all and expect people to believe us. We have to show it. And I think one of the, one of the ways to do that is to start creating uh, legislative stepping stones. And so the Medicare expansion issue, uh, which is going to be on the table. And really, for the first time in a decade, we have a which side are you on moment, where the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, representative from San Francisco, wants to give billions of dollars more on a permanent basis to the private insurance industry in the form of subsidies for individuals to buy plans through the Affordable Care Act. That is unacceptable to prop up a murderous business model that profits at the expense of people's lives and divert taxpayer money into shoring up those profits, which included 12.5 billion for United Health, from a city like San Francisco that embodies humanistic values that has actually one of the best solidaristic responses to the COVID pandemic. It's not perfect, but it's better. The infection rate's lower, the death rate's lower uh, in the Bay Area than any place else in the state. And so that solidaristic politics, the politics that favors collective action, that says we're not on our own and we're not going to give the insurance industry more money to deny us care, is directly contradicted by the speaker's position. And you have to ask, well, since 85% of San Franciscans support Medicare for all, is popular support sufficient? And you have to ask what is going on? And when you do, you realize that this is, was not, that the, the emphasis on Bernie Sanders was not some uh, naive notion of the great, you know, person of history theory. It was a recognition that without presidential leadership, Medicare for all is not going to happen. And the reason it's considered less political, politically viable is because Joe Biden opposed it. Just like in California, it's not going to happen unless Governor Newsom leads or whoever's the governor. And so we have to understand why is that? that you know, the speaker's not gonna take on the president. The speaker's not gonna take on the industry if it's a divisive fight that she doesn't think she can win or is too problematic politically because it disrupts donor relationships. And finally, she's, she's not really gonna take on the hospitals. You have to, and the nurses know this, Martise and others know this. Why didn't many hospitals, hundreds, thousands of hospitals around the country not have protective personal equipment? Because the hospital industry opposed the mandate to provide it. And the hospital's CEO is on the speed dial of every chief of staff in Congress. Nancy Pelosi is deeply, deeply, deeply related to the hospital industry. The one thing they don't want and why you hear them oppose the public option is because they don't want rates, they don't want lower rates. They'll take the huge administrative expenses, $650 billion a year, according to the Congressional Budget Office, as the price they pay for those high reimbursement rates from commercial insurance that increase their capital budgets and give them the money and control to set their corporate healthcare prerogatives. And that means creating silos, closed networks, and unfettered ability to raise prices. That's what they have now, and that's what they want to keep. So instead, we have to make the hospitals who profited mostly either from fewer patients during the pandemic and continued reimbursements or just outright you know, grants from the government. And the insurers have particularly profited during the pandemic. And we have to make that industry, the healthcare industry along with pharma, the hospitals, insurers, as toxic as tobacco was and has become politically because they are just as murderous. Their whole business model depends upon denying people care and restricting their ability to get the services and care they need. And so the, the, F, the Democrats can no longer front for them. Nancy Pelosi should no longer uh, take and lead and front for the healthcare industry and their political agenda. Their political contribution should be toxic. And until she stops taking them, that is a point that we need to hammer home. I think we also, um, when we look, I, I started to mention the legislative path, Medicare expansion. So the speaker wants to subsidize 
further um, purchase of private plans through the Affordable Care Act exchanges. Instead, Senator Sanders wants to give Medicare to everybody age 55 uh, and over, limit out-of-pocket costs to $2,000 total, and include dental, vision, and possibly hearing benefits. That would make traditional Medicare as attractive and priced comparably as what's known as Medicare Advantage, which are actually for-profit plans that are the most highly profitable part of the insurance industry. So I'm gonna put an article in the chat that I did about um, the Medicare for All expansion. And I think, um, uh, you know, just as a way to say this, it's a great opportunity to join this issue in a, in a way that we haven't in, in quite a while. Um, so I'll put that in the chat when I'm done. Also, I think that the, um, the fight against the ACA subsidies is in and of itself of great value. And it really needs to put the speaker on the spot. The San Francisco congressional representative is leading this effort against Senator Sanders' proposal. And how you confront the House speaker, constituent pressure is not going to be enough but a mass movement to save lives that calls her out for a murderous industry that, that denies care to people of color in particular. That, you know, and that messaging has to get through and really it has to be toxified so that she can't get away with fronting for this industry anymore. And uh, the truth is, is that labor does have the key role to play here. And labor has been hugely disadvantaged. Workers have essentially been told, go out and work. We're not going to protect you. We're not going to give you hazard pay, but you got to go work to sacrifice for the economy. That's just what we do. And that's morally reprehensible. And as socialists, it's the ultimate in, in the exploitation of labor, where you're literally told as a worker, sacrifice your life for capitalism, especially if you're older, as Lieutenant Governor in Texas uh, said. Or as Joe Manchin said, we got these people don't want to work. We can't give them uh, extra benefits because they won't go to work and we need them to work. Well, people are legitimately afraid and unprotected. And yet Joe Manchin's fine with them. Hey, go, go kill yourself for capitalism. That's what we're dealing with. And it we have to literally change um, the political climate. We're not going to move Joe Biden, but we can change the waters in which he swims politically. And that happened, I think that's really what happened, say, for example, with Afghanistan. It just ultimately became untenable uh, politically. And I think things can change that way, but not on their own, not Medicare for all on its own. And labor, uh, as others have mentioned, have, have seen, uh, as Seamus mentioned, have seen huge layoffs and loss of health care. They wanted to go with a private insurance-based solution, which was known as COBRA reform. But that is so inadequate and covers so few people. The fundamental point is you can't have your boss determine what kind of health care you get because that health care won't be very good and he'll use it as leverage to prevent you from striking and to deny you wages and pensions. And that leads to the, I think, really key point with labor. We got to convince workers this is a better deal. It's going to save them money. It's going to be better benefits. It's going to guarantee health care. You're going to go to any doctor of your choice. These are elements, we got to make that educational case. We got to bring workers along. We got to tell them concretely, it's not going to be enough to make the moral case. We got to tell them concretely, it's going to cost you this and it's substantially less and it's going to get you this and it's substantially more. You're going to pay less and get more. And we got to make that case specifically uh, to workers and to, um, to, to the unions who aren't on board, but a majority, a union representative majority of workers does support Medicare for all. Finally, um, a couple other things. I really agree with Stephanie. A place like California that provides healthcare to undocumented folks, that's exactly the precedent we want. Repealing the Hyde Amendment. We gotta clear the deck of these social issues. The industry is gonna come at us in a major way. One thing they're gonna say is, oh, these crazy leftists, they just want one size fits all. <laughs> yeah, one size fits all where you can go to the doctor of your choice and get all the healthcare that you need, not just that you can afford. And we're gonna to have to win that argument too. And we're going to have to win the argument as part of a broad social movement for justice and be the healthcare wing of the broader social justice movement. 
Let's put Medicare for all as the demand in the Breathe Act. Let's make the health insurance industry, hospitals and pharma as toxic as tobacco. Let's build a mass movement to save lives and let's make it impossible for the representative from San Francisco to do the morally re reprehensible pro-corporate position of sacrificing workers for the healthcare industry and their murderous business model. We've got to make it so that she and whoever follows her cannot continue to take that position. And I think San Francisco DSA is doing great work and has a huge role to play in that fight. But ultimately, it's all of us. And we can build a better world. We can build a world based on solidarity. And Medicare for all is really at the linchpin of that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael. Um, I only see so far one question uh, formulated in um, chat. And so I think I'm going to ask if uh, Sandy Eaton, who is the person who formulated, would like to uh, deliver the question himself. Uh, before I do that, however, um, let me just uh, set this pattern. What I'll do, uh, we told all the panelists that uh, any question, regardless of whether it was directed to a single person or not, could be answered uh, by all of them. I'm going to just go um, down the list. The next, uh, this round, I'll start with Stephanie, and the next question, I'll start with Seamus, et cetera, um, and call on you. Don't feel obligated if you really don't want to take the question, just pass. But uh, I think for simplicity's sake, that would be the best way to do it. One other thing, um, Seamus, you have um, had connection problems speaking earlier. Uh, and we're lagging at certain points. I don't know if you can tell at your end, but um, if it happens again, uh, I'm gonna mention it. So if you want to uh, shut off your camera, which sometimes work, you could try that. But uh, just, a, just a thought. Um, so uh, Sandy, would you like to uh, ask a question? Well, Tom, uh, thanks. Um, there was so much discussion going on uh, throughout the chat. Uh, that you'll have to remind me uh, exactly what the question was. <laughs> well, I can't do that at this moment. Oh, okay. I uh, let me let me direct you back to chat, and uh, I will put one out uh, based on uh, for openers uh, based upon um, things that have been discussed. Seamus mentioned the question of uh, forcing the vote, um, which he said. Uh, um, he was not talking about today, but perhaps in six months. When this question came up uh, earlier, it was before the uh, new Congress was uh, sworn in, and there were people hot to trot to uh, to force the the matter right then. Um, but as I say, Seamus has uh, talked about it in a longer uh, uh, time frame. What uh, do any of you think about this? Uh, particularly and perhaps more importantly as an example of uh, something we should or should not take as, as an approach. So I'll, uh, as I say, uh, no one should feel obligated to answer all questions, but I will uh, start with Stephanie if she uh, okay. wishes to answer. Okay. Um, can I answer Sandy's question? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we'll yeah. <laughs> Force the vote. Um, yeah, so force the vote. I mean, I think that um, I think that the, that we feel that you know force the vote is something that you know we can do, and there will be no negative repercussions of like like I don't I don't think that anybody was saying that we would force a vote and then we would get Medicare for all. I know that that's not what we think is going to happen, right? We think we're just going to expose legislators and you know. Uh, and force them to come to our side. And I think that's a very reasonable thing to think, but I'm not exactly sure that that's actually how it will go down. I think it could actually go down in a much worse way that would put us backwards rather than bring us forward. Um, I think, you know, this actually was tried a little bit kind of back in, I can't remember the year, maybe Michael Lighty can remember it, um, but Anthony Weiner and back when he was a legislator, they wanted to bring a vote uh, for Medicare for all or for like a Medicare for all amendment or something in a bill. 
And in the end, it was actually retracted by John Conyers um, and the other bill's author because they didn't think, they actually thought it was gonna go so badly that, you know, um, that they just decided that they were gonna, they were just gonna scrap it. And that in itself, I mean, you know, that could have been a dereliction of leadership, but it also could be because, you know, we don't have financing in this bill. We don't have like, for example, you know, the legislators who wanted to get out of it while still being sort of on the fence about Medicare for all could say something like, well, um, you know, we don't actually know what, it, how much taxes are going to go up in the middle class. So I'm not going to vote for this because we don't, it hasn't gone through the, the budget committee yet or hasn't gone through ways and means yet. Um, and they could find some really good reason to not vote for something that hasn't gone through all the committees, you know, um, and actually make us look, make it look like Medicare for all is not politically feasible, which is exactly the thing we've been fighting all these years to sort of uh, establish that Medicare for all is very politically feasible. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we have a, a bill that has actually gone through committee where we can like point to, yes, this is, this is exactly how this is going to work. And this is going to be like this for this group of people. And the taxes are going to look like this and the benefits are going to look like this, then absolutely let's force the vote. Thank you. Uh, Seamus. Um, I already talked about this a bit, but I'll just say that um, a vote is supposed to be the culmination of the campaign. So having a vote right now, not strategic, if we then mobilize and build power, then a vote is essential. Uh, every campaign needs a timeline. And so this campaign need, organizers in this campaign need to know what the goal is, when they expect to cross the finish line. And if we don't have that, that's gonna cause more demoralization. It's a problem that has to be addressed one way or another. Uh, when does this campaign see itself winning? So, and again, the calculus changes politically when we mobilize. And I don't know all the, all the answers, and I could be wrong. Maybe if we mobilize, nobody shows up. Well, we have to test this one way or another. As an, or, an organizer, or, organizing is concrete. People come or they don't come to the event. You build power or you don't. I'm saying we have to let the demand off the leash, mobilize, build power in an attempt to then force the vote and win this demand. Thanks. Thank you. Tom, I'll just, yeah, just weigh in quickly. Um, I agree with Seamus. I, I want to um, vote when we're going to win the vote. And um, having been uh, involved in kind of part of the motivation for the uh, scenario that Stephanie laid out with uh, Anthony Weiner, fear, fear, you know, figuring a lot of the vote, force to vote logic uh, could apply. Turned out I was wrong. And I think um, in this case, if we force a vote over the will of the speaker, that vote will fail. That's just the nature of the institution. And so again, we go back to, we've got to change the political waters We've got to make it something that they can't vote against. And we, and that is both, I think, as Stephanie said, it is part of the congressional process. But honestly, hearings and the congressional process and getting co-sponsors, in part because that support is shallow, um, isn't going to be sufficient. You literally have to create a mass demand that cannot be denied. And, and we're not there yet. And look at, you get 25 million people in the streets demanding rape, racial justice and demanding an end to police killings of black people, especially, obviously extends beyond that to uh, Latino, Latina folks, as, as, as well as other people of color. And, and you realize, wow, 25 million people in the streets and mm, the legislation hasn't yet reflected those radical and necessary demands. So that gives us a sense of what we're up against. And that means, uh, I think, being very smart and understanding what what uh, what situation we're in. That's why I look at Medicare expansion. If you listen to Representative Jayapal, she says the bill is not moving this year. The Medicare for All Act is not moving this year. And if the sponsor says that, you know, uh, that's probably uh, reality. 
and I think we've got to build on that kind of mass demand to get us to where uh, Seamus and others want us to get, where we need to get. Thank you, Michael. Susan. Let me unmute. <laughs> you know, looking at it from the perspective of a minority, and as much as I understand how much we need Medicare for all, I think my community is so overwhelmed with survival struggles nowadays. What has happened with the Voting Rights Act, with the the police that have just have no rules anymore and the fact that unless it gets video there's no um you know action taken on their uh bad actions it's it's kind of it's a difficult because of it's a difficult struggle because of what else is happening in the lives of so many people in this country they don't know whether they're going to eat tomorrow whether they're going to be housed tomorrow whether they're going to be clothed tomorrow and although healthcare is something we need it's not unless we are chronically ill or seriously ill it's not a day-to-day -day issue of survival and i think there's so many people in this country especially people of color who are focused on day-to-day -day survival that it's just difficult. I find it difficult to convince other Black people to support Medicaid for all, Medicaid, Medicare for all. Um, it's just the, the way life has become in this country now. You can't even draw your car and say, I'll be home and mean it because you don't know. So I'm not saying that to belittle the cause because I'm not. I mean, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't. But I just looking at what else is on so many other people's plate, it doesn't become, it doesn't rise to the top a lot. And I think it's there'll be maybe some Congress people who don't want to risk support on these other issues by taking a vote on this. Thank you. Um, I think uh, back to uh, Sandy for that uh, question. Am I wrong? Uh, are you asking me to answer the question about forcing the vote? No, 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 no. I, I thought you had your question. Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> okay, um, well, um, getting people to write their questions in chat is not proving too uh, successful. Uh, Adam, you have a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll just read it. Uh, but here goes. Um, I think we're going around in circles with the force the vote discussion. The point is that we need a target and timeline to mobilize around. Um, I think having a force vote would give us that. And that's part of the appeal. Uh, but there are clearly parts of our movement that don't feel comfortable with that strategy. In my view, that's m more uh, at the leadership level than at the at the grassroots level. But you know, be that as it may, the question then becomes, what are we going to do instead? Um, Seamus mentioned, I think he got cut off a little bit, but I believe he mentioned the idea of a national day or days of action this summer. Um, I, I, I think that's a that's a good proposal. I think that we're we're in a very unique moment where we it's been very difficult to mobilize um, under the conditions of COVID, but we're going to come out from under COVID restrictions at some time and to some extent this summer or fall uh but there will be a moment where the kind of hellishness of this last you know year plus is still very fresh in people's minds how do we use that moment um to move forward with the movement um anyway to continue to continue with what i've written here i think i think that's a good idea i personally think it would be a stronger idea if we also use that moment as part of a renewed force vote strategy but i don't think that's an indispensable part um so how do our panelists feel about beginning a discussion around this, some kind of target or timeline, perhaps a national day of action or something similar to that. And I'll leave it at that. All right, uh, thank you. Let's start with Seamus, uh, national day of action or something like that, uh, et cetera. Uh, thoughts? Uh, well, I already said, uh, I think that's a good idea, uh, but I'll also add, um, I think it's probably best if we 
combine our demand with a couple others. You know, there's some, there's a national housing crisis happening. Black Lives Matter. You know, these are demands that have a mass appeal and combining a couple for like a, a COVID response national day of action of things that we want and need uh, might be one good approach to take with this. That's it. All right, thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'd rather force the vote on the Breathe Act. I'd rather get Medicare for All in the Breathe Act and make that the demand because it does encompass so many aspects of the struggle and uh, it really takes advantage of the moment. I think probably we're still emerging from the pandemic. There have been groups who've tried to organize national marches uh, in DC and they failed uh, horribly. I think that this is probably not the right summer to do that just given how we're emerging from the pandemic. And I think it is tough given the reality that Susan talked about. I mean, you've got this disconnect. You've got the base of the congressional support in members of Congress from, you know, who are black, Latino, Latina, uh, and, and Asian uh, American Pacific Islander. That's our base in Congress. And yet these communities are in survival mode. This is not, so the disconnect is, is real. I think there is a fight over Medicare expansion we should do. And I do think that the organizations behind the BREATHE Act, I know they support Medicare for all, but it's not the healthcare provision in it. Get it in there get the number of co-sponsors up past 1976 and wage just what, what Seamus is talking about, this multi-racial uh, broad constituency for justice. And that, I think that kind of action could move a bigger agenda. Do you, uh, Susan, anything on this? Well, I'd just like to see a push for, you know, improve Medicare um, rather than pushing for it, lowering the age or something like that, only because I think that the biggest threat to traditional Medicare that we have now is Medicare Advantage. And is, if we allow to lower the age, where are those people going to go? They're going to go to Medicare Advantage. That's their ideal that's their ideal person, you know, who's healthy enough to use the health club membership that they give you. You know, they aren't going to cost that much. But if we improve traditional Medicare, that'll eliminate the market for Medicare Advantage. And then we can, people will be able to see, well, yes, traditional Medicare works. And that's, that, the, that, that's the proposal, Susan, to improve Medicare, set the out of pocket no limit at 2000. Uh, include dental and hearing and make it as attractive as Medicare Advantage. The okay. belief at the policy level is, is that people will go into that improved Medicare instead of Medicare Advantage. That's the intent. But they also talk about lowering the age and it's not clear where this is going to fall from what I understand. The lowering the age is the toughest part to get. They're going to use the uh, money if they can get it from the prescription drug negotiation to fund improved benefits and cap the out-of-pocket costs at $2,000 per beneficiary, which is better than Medicare Advantage. The whole purpose is to improve traditional Medicare so that people go into that instead of Medicare Advantage. Then if they do all that and we get the lower age, that's the full package. But the belief is, is that the lowering age is the toughest to get and we're gonna be able to use the savings from drug purchasing to improve Medicare. But that, but it's still not from the last time I talked with the legislator, it wasn't clear on what side, what they were going to, which way they were going to push. But that was a, so, I mean, I'm on board for what is there, but I wasn't clear that that was definitely what they were pushing still. So, okay, we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah, just, it does, of course, depend on what Biden does too, right? Because he's going to come out with a reconciliation package and the speaker is playing a very nefarious role pushing those ACA subsidies. I think those are the two, and I agree with you, it's not set, right? Yeah. Improving yeah. Medicare for all won't involve a public health insurance company, so she won't be for that. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephanie, anything on this? Oh goodness. Um, yeah, I think that the, the idea of a national day of action, um, you know, it's, it's sort of um, a tactic more than a strategy. Um, and, you know, 
uh, I think that we are drawn to such things because it makes us feel like we're part of like a national movement that's doing something nationally. But I think what's sort of needed at this time, at this point in our movement, right? I, I guess I didn't talk about this, but one of the things that you know happened with the co-sponsorship has been that we had a massive jump, um, you know, when Bernie Sanders ran and Medicare for all. Yeah, you know, moved to the top of the agenda. Um, and then over the last couple of years in HR 1384, we only got a couple more co-sponsors. So we sort of like had this one big leap and we've sort of stagnated a little bit. And I think that's also part of the frustration with force the vote. Um, and so I think that there actually has been a lot of days of actions that the movement has had over the last year or so. And that, um, you know, for the current moment, the concept of a day of action has uh, has reached the extent of its usefulness, I guess. And um, because our movement needs to sort of, it's grown a lot within leftist circles, but now it needs to grow more. Um, and so uh, just thinking about like, what would be useful in terms of growing the movement outside of the circles that we have right now, um, if a day of action would be useful for that, then we should do it. If other tactics, maybe more like local organizing that's focused, um, you know, less on having like a national feel to it. Not that I don't appreciate what, um, you know, uh, Michael Leidy has been saying about uh, combining or being the like left, the healthcare wing of the overall broader social justice movement. And, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but just thinking like strategically about what is next, like what will bring us next to the next phase of, of um, uh, the next big leap that we want to take uh, for Medicare for all. Um, I'm not sure if a national a day of action will, would be that. Thank you. Um, Susan uh, informs uh, me that uh, she has another commitment and will probably have to leave before the end. Uh, so let me just uh, take this moment to ask you, Susan, um, we're we're planning to give everyone two minute uh, wrap up time. Um, any final thoughts uh, you'd like to share before you go? Um, I think that one of the things that we have to, one of the things that we have to make sure we do with when we get Medicare for all, I'll phrase it like that, is that we have to have meticulous oversight of how this is how this is done. Um, we have seen a lot of things that have come from the feds that were supposed to be equitable and they never were. Uh, public education is supposed to be equitable and it isn't. All the, the services that are not uh, present now in poor communities aren't there. Um, and we have to make sure that one of the things that we push for Medicare for all is making sure that resources are put where they are needed and not where they could make profit. And we have to make sure that those resources are need are placed where they're needed and those services are equitable with everywhere else. And we can't have just a second tier or third tier facilities in poor neighborhoods. And that's the way it's always kind of been done in this country. So that's where a lot of work is still going to have to, you know, even after this is passed, um, I'm saying that very optimistically, um, that there's still a lot of work to be done to make it as equitable as we say it will be. All right. Thank you very much for that and for your participation and more importantly for all of your work on the issue. Thank Have a you. good afternoon, Susan. Uh, I believe we have a question from Kate. If so, um, speak. Am I wrong? Uh, wrong? Yes, hi. Um, okay. Oh yes, my question was, um, so after 9-11, um, the individual cities signed um, petitions against the Patriot Act. And I was wondering if a similar strategy in California could be effective. Um, I think Oakland, and I was wondering first off, what cities have passed such a petition on the city level um, to, to do the AB um, 1400? And then 
Um, and then if maybe we could work on a statewide effort of um, the ones, like if the city of Oakland, for example, has passed it, then other cities could use that same wording um, on their city councils. And then we could create a list of cities just like they did in 9-11 against the Patriot Act, because there were over 500 cities nationwide that signed against the Patriot Act. So if that could maybe be a strategy for the AB 1400. Uh, okay, and let's of course extend uh, Kate's question to the nation um, through the wonders of Zoom. Uh, so let's start with Michael. So Public Citizen is leading an effort to get city councils to pass resolutions in support of uh, Medicare for All. In California, that takes the form of resolutions that support 1976, AB 1400, and the governor's effort to lead on the question and get federal support through a waiver. And so, uh, Kate, you're right. That has passed, you know, San Francisco, Oakland, Emeryville, um, uh, a few other places. And it's an ongoing effort. Uh, there's a big effort to get it through the Los Angeles City Council. Um, that's on, that's in process. I can't remember. If we've, I don't think we've succeeded yet. And a number of other cities. So it's a very useful effort. Public citizens doing, I know Healthcare Now is involved um, and, 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 and in you in the effort nationally, right, to get city councils on. And I think it does have a cumulative impact when a, when a member of Congress sees, you know, all the city councils in its district, particularly if you get it in red cities, you know, if you can go to these, some of the smaller towns and rural areas and try to address some of the concerns that Stephanie raised, it has real value, but it, I think it has to be done strategically. And there was an effort kind of low hanging fruit-esque, you know, let's just get the councils we can easily get, same places we already have co-sponsors. I don't think that's worth much. Uh, you know, particularly um, as an educational event, sure, one off, whatever. But if you want to do some strategic organizing around it, try to engage local elected officials in red districts or other places that are tougher to get and see if that helps move them uh, and those constituents and put pressure on the member. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah. Yeah. Um I'll just quickly say, I, I think I, I, I really agree with what Michael said. I think it's useful as an organizing vehicle um, to build maybe your base or something like that. If you're, especially if you're in like a district where you haven't gotten your legislators on the bill. Um, Medicare for all is just one of those annoying things that <laughs> kind of has to be won at like a really high level. It's not like, you know, gay marriage where it was like, let's just pass it in like, you know, here or there, and then we'll pass it to state level. And we'll, you know, it's just like an all or nothing thing. And so it's sort of annoying that we don't have more incremental steps <laughs> to get us there. Um, but yeah, just to say that, that yeah, exactly what, what Michael said. Seamus. I'll pass. Okay. I believe we have a question from uh, Bill Loomer. Yeah, I'm coming at this from a pro-organizing perspective. And I was just wondering where people thought we could begin to get the pro medical for all unions involved around the theme of organizing and mobilizing uh, to take action. And which of the organizations in the black community, the Latino community, et cetera, uh, can be approached to begin to build an action-oriented coalition. I know there's a lot of uh, unions and activists and, uh, that are engaged that uh, are interested in doing this. In fact, in San Francisco DSA, we have we just had a panel um, by the Labor Organizing Committee on Medicare for All and organizing at work. Um, and that was a, a very successful panel. And uh, it just seems to me that we got to pinpoint and reach out and make the kind of connections uh, that haven't been yet made. Because um, it seems to me that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me if, if labor takes action for Medicare for all, it'll be a big step in, in their political independence. It'll mean they're not just relying on Democratic Party politicians, but they're organizing themselves. And that in and of itself would be an enormous pressure point that could be raised and expanded across the country if coalitions in various cities uh, could start organizing around taking action in the future. How's that sound? All right. Uh, thoughts on that, uh, 
simple question, <laughs> Stephanie. Hmm. Yeah, I I do think <laughs> uh, that unions are going to be key to winning Medicare for all. At the same time, unions don't love being organized by people who are not in unions. <laughs> um, but it's I think that it's always worth uh, trying to reach out to them in coalition um, and um, and making and making a connection that way. Um, I think that when you're talking about uh, communities of color, it's something that you um, it's best to to go to approach uh, a community of color, which as Dr. Rogers had mentioned before is drowning in all sorts of other immediate crises. Um, like how, I mean, in Boston, it's like housing, um, the, tr the, the widespread trauma of police brutality that we're having to deal with every day. I mean, all of that stuff. And so um, listening and I, I think a listening campaign um, is super useful. You know, we just had a podcast uh, where we had um, Ursula and Yuling from the New York, um, the Campaign for New York Health Act. Um, they came on the podcast and they were talking about this like listening campaign that they did a storytelling campaign uh, where they invited people to fill out a form about how healthcare, you know, um, how they have been impacted by the healthcare crisis and affordability and access and all of that. Um, and that I think is the best way to reach new constituencies um, that may not have healthcare as like the very first thing on, on their plate. Chavis. Uh, yeah, that is kind of a complex question. Um, well, you know, National Nurses United, of course, is a leader on this issue. And I think they have a very special role to play here. Uh, if they come out with an, a more aggressive campaign than what we're seeing right now to kind of get us beyond this post Bernie demoralization, that could be a trigger. Uh, Labor for single, single Payer has a lot of organizations, unions they've worked with over the years, like I said earlier, that could be reached out to. Um, and, you know, um, in the chat, Anne commented about United Front demands. Um, we need to organize with other uh, movements as well. I know there's a big campaign for the PRO Act right now happening in DSA. Um, I think adding the PRO Act could be good as part of a coalition effort, but there should be a coalition effort on some level. I think DSA has a really important role to play here. Um, and I think they can work with the National Nurses United and a couple others to really lead because most of labor uh, have been traditionally followers. They get on the bandwagon once their members get on the bandwagon and, and clamor for their leaders to join up. Uh, that's it. Michael. I do um, share the uh, uh, support for United Front strategy, as I said. I don't think we're going to get this on its own. I, I agree you know, with Stephanie that it is kind of an all or nothing proposition, but I also think that the Medicare expansion can get us a little bit of the way there. But more importantly, it can undermine the legitimacy of subsidizing the purchase of private insurance and, and, and buttressing the model of the murderous uh, healthcare industry. And I do think that the, um, uh, we have to understand that labor, it's not that labor doesn't support Medicare for all. There's broad support. I mean, you've got unions who supported Biden who supported the Jayapal bill last session. It is not a priority. It is, they've got three or four other things that are more important, or when they're at the bargaining table, they're just trying to keep what they have. And it's true that the pandemic um, ended up creating a huge amount of job loss, but it's also not true that folks went uninsured at high numbers. You've got some estimates as low as one or two, three million people who are uninsured. This has to do with the fact that many of the people who lost jobs um, worked in industries that didn't offer health insurance, that Medicaid picked up the slack, and that some unions, like in the hospitality industry, paid their members health insurance for six months and only got relief when they passed the recent COVID Relief Act. And, and these, those insurance payments going forward are going to be paid through COBRA, 
to the uninsured. So the uninsured crisis resulting from COVID was not as great as we thought. But of course, what was what was tragic and profound was the essential workers and the healthcare workers who died because they weren't protected and, and, and were forced to go to work. So I do tend to think that, that um, if we're going to uh, be able to reach out to labor and reach out to communities of color, those are integrated. I am doing consulted work for National Union of Healthcare Workers. Those members who work uh, primarily in mental health, tech, and service in the healthcare industry, many of them come from precisely those communities that we want to reach out to, those frontline communities that have been directly impacted by COVID, especially, full of essential workers. So the union leadership going out into those communities, meeting with community clinics, meeting with community-based organizations, bringing them on board to Medicare for All, that's the kind of combination of listening, being rooted in those communities, and promoting a policy and addressing their concerns about that policy, and telling them how it directly, immediately impacts their lives, and how it is going to help their clinics provide services, and their organizations uh, thrive. And so I think you have to build on those organic connections, I think we have to bring the message and we have to be part of a broader fight that shows we're clearly com committed to justice and to understanding that police brutality, the murdering of black men, this is state sanctioned violence that's a public health crisis that creates a mental health crisis that has created a mental health crisis. You listen to Dr. Rogers, you can see that. And so let's, let's be real about the public health crisis that it's a heart of, of, of what's wrong with the society. And it's also true, of course, of the climate crisis. And so let's not forget that literally everything is everything and figure out a way. Uh, we're gonna have to move labor on Green New Deal. We're gonna have to move labor on Medicare for All. And ultimately the DSA rank and file strategy is essential to that because uh, Seamus is right. Clearly the members demanding this because that's what a lot of these uh, leaders are afraid of. They're gonna be asked questions. What's it gonna cost me? What are my benefits gonna be? Are you telling me this is gonna happen for sure? Labor leaders are like, if you can't answer that question, they're going to do. They're going to pursue a policy where they do know the answers. Thank you. Um, I was actually going to uh, take someone's comment. I don't see any more questions out there at the moment. I was actually going to take uh, a comment that had been made on chat and turn it into a question. But I, I think it's actually been addressed. But I'll just uh, the question of whether there really is some. Uh, disaster that is an opportunity here that we're missing. Um, and Michael, you just spoke to the fact that surprisingly fewer um, have been, uh, have lost their uh, health insurance. Um, if uh, anybody wants to, uh, of the three of you would like to further speak on that, um, say so. Um, I think, it, as I say, you may have addressed it. If I don't hear anybody, uh, let me let me throw in um, uh, a question, it's, uh, sort of an oddity perhaps uh, towards the discussion, there may be nothing we can do with it. It's the uh, nomenclature question, the naming question of the program that we seek. I mean, we started out with this problem a long time ago when we came up with uh, single payer first, and that was a policy decision as well, right, to go for the Canadian model rather than the National Health Service model, because we didn't think people would, would buy it. But the name was what? And people used to say when you were campaigning on that, uh, you single parent health care? Um, it just, they didn't know what you were talking about. We moved over to Medicare for all. Um, for the obvious reason that Medicare is a known thing nationwide. The problem that it brings with this that I have encountered in surprising places is that people assume it means Medicare as it actually exists. Quite logical, right? And people um, who you would totally expect uh, would be for Medicare for all have a better program than what Medicare is now. They do not uh, read the uh, the small print of the, the bill, of course, but also we have failed to convey that. And I have found this in the most surprising places. Let me say a member of our of the committee putting this on. Um, I've I found and it's no one here today. Um, 
did not realize this. He was, of course, for Medicare for All, thinking that he was probably advocating a lesser program for himself, but he was doing it in the spirit of national support. Is there anything to be done about this? I don't know if uh, I've raised a question that has any useful answers, um, but it's a thought. Stephanie, I hear uh, a, oh, a sigh. Well, <laughs> no, I just, I actually had something to say about the previous question. Oh, go right ahead. Is go it right okay? Ahead. Yes, um, and I can certainly say something about that question too, but um, yeah, I think that this is, this really, you know, speaks to something that we're all feeling right now. This, that COVID has uh, sort of made the healthcare industry finally indefensible entirely, right? Um, and, you know, I think that the reason that we haven't really seen, I mean, we we went from 112 co-sponsors to 115 from last year to this year. So obviously nothing really has moved in Congress. We haven't actually seen a huge shift in the needle on polling in Medicare for All, uh, despite this. Um, and I think that the reason is because people don't, I mean, by and large in rough rough measure, I mean, people don't really need to be convinced more about Medicare for all. That's not actually the problem we're having. Um, I, I always talk about the gun control movement when we talk about this, right? Something like 90% of 90% um, of Americans, like broad across the board, support for um, background checks in all contexts for buying guns. Um, and yet we still do not have um, a, a, a gun law, right? That ensures that we'll have background checks. And, you know, every single time we have a mass shooting, we think this is the time, this is the time, this is the time. And obviously the problem isn't public opinion, right? Public opinion got us this far, but you know what is actually gonna take us over the edge and get us gun control laws is actual organizing. So we think that these like pivotal sort of strategic moments are going to catapult us it catapults Congress into doing the right thing. But again, we only get what we're organized to take. And if we haven't gotten this and there's been a pandemic and all of this stuff, then we're not organized enough to take it yet. And I think, you know, I think it just shows that, you know, a lot of movements can fall prey to this, that, you know, we're gonna have this like moment and we're gonna, and then we're gonna be able to pass the bill, but it's actually that legislators don't really, your legislator doesn't really give a shit what you, think if you want you know background checks or guns if you want medicare for all unless you have the power to hold them accountable for what they do um, and only then um, are you going to get what you want thank you um any other of the uh panelists on this or the other question i'll say a thing yes please. um yeah, well, I think part of why the needle hasn't moved is that the we have to look in the mirror and you know post Bernie, I think there was a steep drop off of activity on the left in general, and that's what really needs to be revived. There is opportunity because of the pandemic, but it has to be funneled. That energy has to be funneled. Uh, and one way you do that traditionally in organizing is you give people opportunities to organize around an action or actions. Um, and we're not seeing, I'm not seeing much action happening uh, across the country and DSA. Uh, that's, that's why I rec suggested one idea of uh, a mass mobilization. Uh, that is a tactic, but it's an opportunity to organize around, to gather the troops, to assess your strength. And that's also what the force of the vote does. A vote is an opportunity to organize around something important. So we need more of these actions. We need more big things to organize around, to knock on doors about. Uh, otherwise, it seems like nothing's going to happen. We can't hear you any longer, Seamus. I assume you're finished <laughs> since your lips aren't moving anymore. 
Uh, okay. Um, Michael, but, I'll jump in. I'll jump in here on on. Um, I think that the, I think the needle did move a little bit on COVID, um, on Medicare for all because of COVID. Not a not a huge amount, and and I certainly agree. We haven't made huge strides in Congress, but again, do not underestimate in kind of the D.C. political culture the impact of the president's position, right? And we are a movement led by congressional uh, representatives, and that's got to change. And the civil rights movement was not led by a senator or a member of Congress. It was a it was led by uh, a lot of women and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and 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 many of his associates. And ultimately, it was led by you know uh, Bobby Seal and Huey Newton and Elaine Brown and. Um, lots of others, Fred Hampton and, and many others, you know, the anti-war movement, these were movements that uh, changed what was on the political agenda. And we're gonna have to do that. Unlike gun control, uh, gun, uh, gun control has a huge constituency, a grassroots constituency opposed to uh, gun violence restrictions. We don't have a grassroots constituency opposed to Medicare for all. We have highly profitable and powerful uh, industry and politicians. And so we just need to be clear on that. There's just no, there's no rational um, belief, I don't think, that um, forcing a vote over the speaker's objection and losing big because she opposes it strengthens us. I'd like to hear that case. And so it had that moment, and if you look at the history of mobilizations, um, days, you know, national days of action, they're limited. Uh, we don't really need to organize everywhere. We don't really need to raise the media profile of the issue. What we need to do is move a set of senators and Congress members, many of whom are not from urban districts that support Medicare for all by 85%, like the speaker's district does. Um, and you know, we've got to move those folks. So the organizing project is people's action is doing intensive organizing, developing a corporate campaign to toxify the industry. Uh, that's where I think we need to go is we've got to make this industry as toxic as tobacco. We've got to improve Medicare to address the concerns that Tom has raised. Because I think the one way to, we, we can't change our messaging at this point. Medicare for all is it. We can talk, I think, I mean, when you've got a national spokesperson who's ran for president twice and gotten tens of millions of votes and almost took out uh, the representative of the strongest political machine in the, in the country, Hillary Clinton, uh, and have, have substantially moved, I think, uh, pieces of the Democratic base, uh, yeah, well, we got to consolidate our support among Democrats. We got to change the speaker's mind or replace her uh, with someone who does support Medicare for all. And we've got to align with these other movements. Then you could talk about, I think, a national day of action in that context. Mm. And I think you can address the, the terminology problem. Uh, we're, we're doing a educational work I mentioned through NUHW. We ended up you know, talking about single payer, you know, but we, but, and DSA in California, it's California Medicare for all. That's a recognition that that messaging is the best not perfect by any means. And if we improve Medicare, uh, then I think we have a basis to say, well, yeah, look at what we've already done. It's gonna get better and it's gonna be for everybody. With that, let me, let me throw out a quick question for the three of you before wrap up statements. Um, Michael has mentioned the California bill. Um, I wonder the thoughts of all three of you on the interplay of state level bills and the federal bill. Um, helpful, harmful, people should work on both equally, et cetera, et cetera. Let me start out with uh, Seamus. Uh, it's hard to say in Oregon here. Um, I think ultimately it depends on the energy in California behind that bill. Uh, if it passes, I think obviously that's a, a great thing nationally. Um, but if there's not energy for it and people are trying to force it, um, maybe it's not the best tactic. Uh, so 
that's kind of a, a, a fluffy answer, but I think ultimately it, it matters where, where people want to move, where there's energy in the organizing space, what people think is possible. Um, that's it. Michael, I know you've been involved in both. Right. Um, look, it, we're, we have a political problem and there's a log jam in Congress. The president opposes our position as does the Speaker of the House. It's natural for a state um, strategy to emerge when federal action seems stymied. And really our best shot, frankly, is California. You've got a governor who ran on the issue. He's got to be held accountable. And if he doesn't move on the issue, then people need to ask, you know, about 22. I don't think the recall is a good idea. Uh, and it's not a good venue to pursue this because you end up with a Republican governor. But, you know, 22 primary may be different. Uh, AB 1400, you know, needs work. Uh, it's got to go through the policy process. But if you were able to get the governor to engage with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who supports Medicare for All, if you were able to build legislative support and bring the key legislators along, the chair of the Health Committee, the Speaker of the Assembly, through governor leadership and, and, and real progress in negotiations with the feds on support and money, for California single payer, then you've got a viable strategy. And if you can do it and, and show that it works, you've got a model for the country. And that may be actually the best political strategy. We're not gonna do a pure, perfectly uh, conceived policy of single payer, but we can move the issue politically and that's what we've got to do. And all of a sudden you've got these folks in red districts in California, who resent others who have health care, all of a sudden they got guaranteed health care. All of a sudden they can go to the doctor. All of a sudden things, their material condition is improved. We're not going to win over all the racists who voted for Trump. We went over 10, 15% of these folks in these Republican districts game on. And I do think the state strategy has real power politically to change the national debate. Mm. Stephanie, any thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm the, you know, uh, the co-chair of the of Mass Care, the Massachusetts campaign for single payer. So, yes, I wholeheartedly believe in the stra state strategy and as something that can definitely bolster the national strategy as well. I mean, it happened in Canada this way famously, right? It was one province and then the uh, and, and it was hospital care and then it was expanded to other provinces and then also physician care. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think that one state, uh, as as Michael was saying, can kind of really lead the way, um, and um, and show people who may be less uh, willing to allow government into their lives, um, show them something that how it can actually work for them. So, all right, thank you. So let's have uh, closing statements. Two minutes, reverse order of opening. So we start with Michael. Uh, first, thank you, Tom. What a, what a great treat to see you and, and thank you for all your extraordinary political work, uh, particularly on the, the peace issue. And uh, thanks to Stephanie and, and Dr. Rogers and, and uh, Seamus. I think it's been really helpful to understand that, this, that there are a lot of strands of the movement and we got to recognize there's huge frustration because we seem so close. And what, what we have to do though is uh, learn from the nurses never give up on patients as they don't and never give up on our country. And, as, and, and also lift up the experiences of the multiracial working class and go after racial capitalism and the fact that workers are being sacrificed for the economy and our health and our lives are being sacrificed for the murderous business model of this industry. Let us tap into that outrage Let's do the targeted strategic organizing that we need to do. And always keep in mind that socialist politics, the transformation of healthcare from a consumer good to a public good, rooted in solidarity, based on justice and equity, that is what is going to win the day. And that is the basis for Medicare for all. And it's the basis for housing and, and social policy as well. So literally our politics are what is going to, um, help create the movement to save lives. So thank you for all you're doing, all of you. Thank you, Michael. Seamus. Yeah, thank you for the invite again. Um, 
I think part of our conversation has been colored in part by movement demoralization, as I mentioned earlier. And I think it's incumbent on leadership to get show its members of this movement that there's a path forward. And that's kind of um, what I've mentioned, the pandemic as an opportunity that has to be seized organizationally. Like we have to get out front, get out publicly and do something and show the members of this movement that we're serious and that we intend to win this demand. Um, and so that involves a timeline. When do we expect to funnel this energy? How long is it gonna take? Um, big actions are necessary for movements to show strength. It's hard during COVID, but Black Lives Matter did it last year. Uh, we have a concrete demand. If we believe in our demand, and if this is the right time for our demand, then we really have to get more concrete on what we plan to do to win this demand and the time frame around that. Uh, thanks again. And finally, Stephanie. Yes, thank you to everybody who came and listened to all of us blather on for two hours. Um, so I guess I'll just finally to drive home my point that <laughs> we need significantly more organizing to win what is going to be the biggest fight that we have ever seen. I mean, there was no moneyed opposition against you know, the Civil Rights Act. There was no moneyed opposition really against um, uh, marriage equality, at least in the same way that there will, there's going to be against uh, Medicare for all. And so we're dealing with a completely unprecedented level of opposition. And I think it's going to take a really unprecedented level of, of organizing. And I think that that organizing at this point where we are, you know, we have stagnated over the past years um, and people are frustrated with that. And I think that we need to uh, focus and remember that all politics is local and that we make the biggest difference for the national movement by focusing on what we can do locally to build a Medicare for all movement to get, for example, <laughs> the speaker of the house uh, on the bill or the speaker of the house out so that we can get somebody else in there. And I know y'all, I mean, Obviously, um, San Francisco DSA has been actually doing an amazing job of that. And so I really want to commend you on um, all the work that you have done to, to run other candidates and to build a movement here um, for, for Medicare for All that's going to actually win and help us, you know, you know, get the leadership that we need uh, to, to pass Medicare for All. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what San Fran uh, DSA does. I'm actually also the co-chair of the Boston DSA Healthcare Working Group. And so um, it's always been really fun to, to get together with other DSAs and, and, and talk and see where y'all are at. All right. Well, with that, I want to uh, thank all of our speakers uh, for coming. I want to thank uh, Taylor for uh, handling the controls. I want to thank Bill Loomer, whose idea this was, and push for it uh, all the way through. And I want to thank you all for coming. Those of you who locally sacrificed a beautiful day, go out and enjoy it. And Stephanie, uh, enjoy Copenhagen. I'm dying to visit it again. I realize you're not there for the best of reasons, but nonetheless, no. <laughs> lovely place uh, in my uh, view. Um, and I, oh, uh, if anybody um, wants to know how to get access to this, uh, the tape of this, uh, contact us through DSA. Uh, the speakers, you all have my email address. You can contact me directly. And uh, with that, I think um, go in peace and health.